Hope International Missions is a worldwide organization with over 35 missionary units, almost 90 individuals, and ministry in more than 20 countries around the globe. Our mission to make disciples of Christ has resulted in untold thousands of lives impacted by the gospel message. I can tell you story after story of people who have been radically transformed by the power of Christ. But it all began in the heart of H. Rob French. When he established FEA Ministries in 1946, one of his ministry goals was to do, quote, missionary work. After Hope Sound Bible College was begun, H. Rob French and S.D. Heron together pursued how to expand the ministry. In 1960, they went to the Bahamas, along with C.J. Goodspeed and a group of students from the college, to investigate starting a work there. Little did they know how God would use that trip to radically impact the lives of some of the young men and women who went. One of those students was Phil Newton. Though a young man in his prime, God called him to move himself and his family to Hope Sound, Florida, where he could begin preparing for the ministry at Hope Sound Bible College. On that trip to the Bahamas, God unmistakably laid a passion for lost souls and for missions on Phil Newton's heart. That was 60 years ago. And though he is now long since retired and a man in his late 80s, that passion for missions still burns in his heart. I wanted to find out just exactly what it was that motivated the Newtons to serve in the Bahamas. What would cause them to leave all behind and to raise their family on a tiny island in the middle of the Caribbean? We made the trip to Pickens, South Carolina to ask Phil and to let him and his wife Betty share some memories of the early days of Hope International Missions. Brother Philip Newton, how in the world? Well, thank you. You doing all right? Yes, sir. It is so good to see you. Tell me a little bit about your beginning years, and as I understand it, you didn't necessarily always serve the Lord. How did how did you come to know Christ? How old were you? Did you were you already married? Can you give me some of that story? I had good parents and a good background and good training, but I got on the wrong track, sidetrack. But anyway, they kept praying for me, and the church prayed a lot of them in the church prayed for me. Until one Sunday morning, I surrendered everything to Jesus Christ, and He came into my heart. And that was the change. That was the real beginning of life. And I never regretted it, and my wife hasn't either. By the time you got saved, uh, things were looking pretty decent for you financially. Am I right on that? That's, that's right, because we just finished several jobs, and. I was cleaning out ditches on the side of the railroad and so forth and in good with the division. My wife and us was living in a shack, so to speak, and I built a new house. And my wife was enjoying her new furniture and uh, the house and we just moved in when this brochure came. I don't know who sent it or where, how I got a hold of it. When I told her we made me move and she sort of, she didn't think too much of that idea. We left and went to Hope Sand and spent 15 years down there. And uh, it's a lot of excitement, exciting days. We had just built a brand new home and I loved it. And one day Phil came in and he said, 
I think I'm going to go to the islands. And I didn't want to go. But you know, God began to speak to me and said, if he's supposed to go and you stand in his way, you'll be sorry. So I just said, let's get ready and go. And I don't regret one minute of it. It was wonderful. Why was it that you felt like God was leading you to Hope Sound? Well, I, I really, I had been out of high school and I wanted to get some, you know, education and all. I believed that God was working and got me down to Hope Sound. And, and where we could get to the island, I didn't know too much about the islands. And uh, the first students and all, we went to the island. When you first got to the island, as I understand it, there was a, a little old lady that had been praying for something like 20 years. I think her name was Drusilla Burroughs. So she had been praying for, she told me, she said, I prayed 20 years that somebody would come to help my people. Even after that first trip, when you went there with a the group of students from Hope Sound, you returned to the islands yes. as missionaries. Yes. And it was at that point in time that Sister Prudence said to her granddaughter, what did she tell her granddaughter? She said, you run and tell them that the missionaries have come and I'll spit on this rock and it better not be dry before you get here. <laughs> get back, you know. She, she was excited to share oh, the good news. Oh, she was very excited. Sister Drusilla Burroughs was faithfully praying for 20 years in the islands that God would send someone to her people to help share the gospel with them. And you feel like God was somehow speaking to you and changing your desires, your passions, and kind of stirring up your nest so that you could be the answer to that prayer for Sister I Burroughs. believe that, and it all goes back to Brother French and the camp and the Brother Aaron and the school, and all of that was working and uh, uh, to get us to the island. Can you explain how the first group of students were invited to the Bahamas and how you went from Hope Sound along with Brother Heron and Brother French or whoever else it was. Can you explain how that first trip took place and how it was arranged? I believe Brother Heron and Sister Lucas and then the young people really got excited. The first group has six, 16 or 17 of us in it. The half of them went to High Rock and half of us stayed at uh, Homes Rock, and we give out track all tracks all over the island and all, and ate together and prayed together and all, and that was the start. You you just couldn't help but love the people and see the needs, and uh, and we when I was out there, I went down to the bush. They were eating dinner, and I just was fasting and praying, and the Lord spoke to me and. Uh, he said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Tears came in my eyes, I guess, and the Lord just put it on my heart to, to work there in, in the Bahamas. And that's, that's when we moved over there next year. And the whole family, we all went. And uh, it, some of the experiences and all, I wouldn't take a million worlds for it. So you planted one church there in Holmes Rock. That was the first church you planted? Hey. And then how many other churches were you personally involved in planting throughout the islands? Well, then at uh, High Rock. Mm -hmm. And then we went, Brother Gray, and then wanted us to go down to Turks and Caicos. So we started at Blue Hills and built that little chapel thing. And then we went over to Conk Barb I believe, and then when we went down and we went to Bottle Creek and then uh, South Caicos. What were some of those early days like trying to carve out a new work and get a new church planted? What are some of those memories that come to your mind? It was hard work. We'd have services, all the, and we've had services, and you might not believe this. This couple would get up and testify, get saved, and, uh, and two or three more would come. And then they'd get up and testify, and, uh, and uh, then more would come. And I, I guess that's the reason I don't like dull religion. <laughs> dull you've, you've tasted what a, a, a yeah. service with the Spirit of the Lord is all about, huh? That's right. And uh, 
you've already given a little bit of an idea of some of those early services where just wave after wave of people would come to the altar and give their hearts to Christ. Did you see a lot of that in those early years? Were, were the people hungry for God? And, oh, and yeah. How, oh, how did you see him moving in the early days down there in the islands? Well, I, I mean, I may be a fanatic, but I preach just like I preach in the United States. I preach against their thieving, their immorality, and all. And when a person broke loose and got saved, they were saved. There's a lot of them that really got saved. So aviation and airplanes were the lifeblood of, of the island work during oh, those days. Oh, man. Well, you take it. Just like here, you got to have a pickup if you do anything. You know what I mean? Sure. And we hauled, he hauled cement mixer sometime with the door open on the plane. And I, I was fully loaded getting ready to come back to States. And the man come up on North, I'd carry beef over to Bottle Creek. Mm -hmm. I said, well, man, I'm loaded now. And when I, I got all that in there and that rough runway, boy, I liked it not stopped. You know, coming in as slow as I could. Sure. And I've had a, I had a blowout and had a that piano in there and all of that. A piano? And, uh, look, yeah, you, you had know, a piano the in there? Low, the low pianos, you could get them in. Sure. And I hauled motorbikes. Wow. And all in the plane, but... Uh, Rumor has it you've hauled a lot more weight in those little planes than it's supposed to be hauled. Oh, yeah, planes. I didn't check the weight. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what it'd do. <laughs> <laughs> Did you haul refrigerators in there? Yeah, I carried a little fridge. And then one man, he wanted to go. And I said, well, I, if you want to ride in the bathtub, you can get it, maybe slide in. He got in the bathtub. <laughs> I uh, went me and brother uh, Melton. We had a goat in there, two goats, and had a pulpit, and I had it loaded. And we left Stuart late, and down there the end, they didn't have lights on the runway or nothing. And I had those goats, and I got over to Nassau, and I got in those water spouts. I mean, in the, I'd never seen that many water spouts. That's why some planes, when they disappear, it'll rip them apart. And uh, so I asked Brother Mountain, I said, Brother Mountain, what do you think we ought to do? He said, I don't know, but we need to get out of here. <laughs> and time I got to Turks, about three more hours, and we opened the door and let those goats out. They looked around at that barren island, and they jumped back in the plane. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we'll take a chance flying back. <laughs> they, were, they were so shook up. <laughs> but I may exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> But it makes for a good story, right? <laughs> so you've shared a whole lot of good memories with us, huh? <laughs> and I've certainly enjoyed learning more about it. I've always appreciated what you've done and always appreciated your vision. And I love seeing the old pictures of you at at work there in the islands. Yeah, yeah the Lord, he had to help us that we couldn't have done it. The Lord's been good to us. How many years have you been married to your wife? Seven and going on uh, about six months now. Oh, wow. Soon be 71. She was willing to give up everything to go to Hope Sound, and there was no trouble when she got on the island. I want to tell you, I married a good woman. 
Tell me about your time in the islands. I loved it. That's all. I, I loved it. I mean, I think it was some of the best part of my life wow. in the island. Wow. And why did you love it so much? Well, there was just the people were so wonderful, and, and they, they just accepted you like you were. And I mean, they were just people that you just loved. The minute you met them, they were just wonderful people. And the thing about it, they were so gracious, you know. Easy to love? Oh, my. They were very easy to love. What made it so good? They were so glad that we were there. Mm. Do you have any regrets from the time that you spent serving Christ in the islands? Never. Never. I loved it. Wow. Would you do it again? I'd do it again if I was able. Well, you and your wife have certainly lived a life of service to God, and uh, you're, an, you're an inspiration to me personally. But I, I kind of wanted to hear just, you know, at, at the foundational level of all of this, what is it that really has compelled you and driven your heart for people and your heart for missions? Uh, why did you give your life to missions like that? Once God saved me, I knew I had been wrong. Christ is a God of love. And if he's in your heart, you're going to love. Do you have any regrets of your life of ministry there in the Bahamas and the islands? No. Man, no. I wish I had three lives. <laughs> That call and that passion of God was just burned on your heart and you couldn't get away from it, could you? Nope. Yep. You still haven't gotten away from it, have you? Oh, no. Nope. 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 <laughs> if, if you could, tomorrow, would you and your wife pack up and go again? Oh, yeah. Oh, love yeah. Love I'd say goodbye. It's been a wonderful life. Betty and me wouldn't swap nothing for the, for the time on the island. Anything else that comes to your mind that you would like to share with us about your time in the Bahamas and maybe even just a, a closing challenge for people to continue to seek God, to see revival, and to see uh, souls saved? Anything you'd like to share with us? I thank the Lord for what He's done in my life and all the praise to Him and tell Him it's, it's worth everything to serve Jesus Christ. And get it where you got enough religion to get you out of your misery. <laughs> The word in the dread to serve Jesus Christ. It's my, my, my. You, and I know these rough days, and I know these uh, times that you go through things and all, but I don't want to lose the joy out of my heart. You know, he, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. He gave me a peace 50-something years ago. <laughs> and we can keep that peace and be a witness and a testimony to the lost and dying people. <laughs>